Welcome students, in today's session we are going to discuss on Hinduism and polity. Hinduism is an amalgamation of many streams of life. Hinduism also known as Sanadana Dharma that is the way of life. It is a natural religion meaning its philosophies and practices are considered universally accessible through sincere study, reason and experience apart from special revelation. Hinduism is also an indigenous religion made up of a diverse family of philosophies and traditions that have been practiced primarily throughout Asia for thousands of years. Today Hinduism is a global religion with adherents representing virtually every racial, ethnic and national background and living on every continent and comprising majorities in three countries namely India, Nepal and Mauritius. Most traditions, sects or schools within Hinduism share certain distinctive foundational concepts despite the absence of an identifiable beginning in history, single founder, central religious establishment or sole authoritative scripture. Two of these foundational concepts are that of the oneness of existence and pluralism. All beings from the smallest organism to man are considered manifestations of the divine reflections of the divine's quality depending upon the school of thought. Because of this shared divinity, Hinduism views the universe as a family or in Sanskrit Vasudeva Kudumbagam. Hinduism also advances the concept of the equal worth of all mankind. No one is superior, none inferior. All are brothers marching forward to prosperity. Mankind because it is believed to be the most spiritually evolved thus carries a special responsibility to honor the equal worth of all people and the underlying unity of existence through one's relationship with oneself and others. Ensuring that one's thoughts, words and actions uphold and promote values such as truth, kindness, equanimity, empathy, generosity and equal regard is how this responsibility is met. The popularly recited Hindu invocation demonstrate this concern for universal kinship and well-being. The meaning of that verse is, may all beings be happy, may all beings be healthy, may all beings experience prosperity, may none in the world suffer. Against the backdrop of this understanding of equality and unity, the Hindu world has been able to embrace the reality of diversity through its philosophy of pluralism. Every being with their varying likes and dislikes, their unique personalities and their different cultures not only connect with one another in their own unique ways but connect with the divine in their own individual ways. It is also clear that for centuries in Southeast Asia, it has been this Hindu brand of absolute pluralism which has proved the ideal environment for peaceful coexistence and prosperity for at least eight major religions including Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, Jainism and Zoroastrianism. Sat Darshanas Darshana literally means seeing and relates to the different ways of seeing the divine and attaining moksha or liberation from the cycle of birth and rebirth. Six darshanas are recognized as most influential. They are as follows. Nyaya, Sankhyaya, Nimamsha and Purva Nimamsha, Yoga and Vedanta. Hindu scriptures, Hinduism is rich in scripture and includes an extensive collection of ancient religious writings. These sacred texts are classified broadly into two categories. They are Shruti and Smriti. The word Shruti literally means heard. 
and consists of what Hindus believe to be eternal truth akin to natural law. Vedas and Upanishads come under this category. The second category of scripture is Smriti, which literally means memory and is distinguished from Shruti in terms of its origin. Teachings in Smriti texts are meant to be remind adherents the eternal truth of Shruti and read and interpreted in light of changing circumstances over Kala, Desha and Guna, where Kala means time, Desha means land and Guna is to do with personality. Puranas. Stories in the Puranas translate the meanings of the ancient Shruti scriptures and teaching them to the masses by explaining the teachings of the Vedas and Upanishads through stories and parables. There are 18 major Puranas which are called as Mahapuranas and many minor one which is called as Uba Puranas, Ramayana. This popular epic tells the life of the noble prince named Ram whom Hindus believe to be an incarnation of the divine. Prince Ram suffers years of exile and many hardships while destroying powerful demons before returning to rule his kingdom. The next epic is Mahabharata. With over 100,000 verses, the Mahabharata is a historical epic and is the longest poem the world has known. Based on an extended conflict between two branches of Gaurava family, the Mahabharata is a true of stories and discourses on the practice of dharma including the importance of truth, justice, self-sacrifice and the upholding of dharma and need for complete devotion to God and ultimate futility of war. The next one is Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a primary scripture for Hindus although it is a tiny part of the Mahabharata and technically classed as a Smriti text it is traditionally accorded the rank of an Upanishad. It is meant to help one understand that upholding dharma can challenging especially in situations where there is not a clear right or wrong. Now we can see mystic Hindu theology. Hinduism developed at least over 5000 years ago in the Indus Valley of India, the largest civilization in the ancient world. Hindus consider the Hindu tradition as having no identifiable beginning or end. The Vedas, one of the Hinduism's primary religious texts, means knowledge in the Sanskrit language and were preserved through a rigorous oral tradition for thousands of years before being written down. They present key Hindu teachings through hymns on the divine forces of nature. Hindu philosophy was further developed in the Upanishads restated in story form in the Puranas, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and through countless life stories, devotional poetry and commentaries by learned sages. Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and Sikhism are often referred to as the Dharma traditions of Indic traditions. The Dharma traditions said many concepts such as dharma, karma, samsara and moksha though each religion understands and interprets them differently. Over many centuries Hinduism's pluralistic ethos was reflected through India's embrace of other religious groups such as Jews, Christians and Jurassians when they were persecuted elsewhere. Now we can see the basic Hindu principles. Brahman is understood as the cause of creation, its creation, its preservation and its dissolution. In Hindu lore, these three functions of creation, sustenance and dissolution are often depicted to be the work of what is commonly referred to as the Hindu trinity of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva respectively. Within Hinduism, there is a broad spectrum of understandings about the nature of Brahman. Most Hindus understand the soul, Atman, to be eternal. When this physical body dies, the soul is reborn in another body 
samsara or continuous cycle of life, death and reincarnation happens. Rebirth is governed by the law of karma that every action has a result like cause and effect. Now we can see the goals of human life. Human life is understood to have four goals. First one is dharma, a mode of conduct most conducive to spiritual advancement. Second one is artha, the material prosperity one pursues. The third one is kama, that is enjoyment of material world. The fourth one is moksha, that is liberation from suffering caused by dependence on the material world and from the cycle of birth and rebirth. Now we can see about the population of the Hindus. Hinduism around the world with more than a billion Hindus, Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world. About 80% of India's population is Hindus and about 45 million Hindus live in neighboring countries in the Indian subcontinent. Since 1965, Hindus have migrated to United States and 2.5 million now live in North America. However, this number does not include Hindus of non-Indian descent. Since number of Hindus still live in various parts of South and Southeast Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, the Middle East and the South Pacific, many Hindus were sent to various colonies by the British as plantation laborers in the 19th and 20th century. Evidence of Hindu influence historically is still seen all over Southeast Asia. Ancient Hindu temples were built in Cambodia and Java and about 4 million Hindus live in Indonesia. Now we can see a brief history of Hinduism. During the Maurya and Gupta empires, the Indian culture and way of life were deeply influenced by Hinduism. Hinduism reinforced a strict social hierarchy called a caste system that made it nearly impossible for people to move outside of their social station. Emperors during the Gupta Empire used Hinduism as a unifying religion and focused on Hinduism as a means for personal salvation. Followers of Hinduism may worship multiple different gods although it is not a polytheistic religion because all these gods are believed to be manifestations of the one Brahman. Agni, Indra, Shiva, Vishnu and Ganesha are just a few examples of Hindu gods that different sects have regarded as the most important gods at various times. Shiva is sometimes associated with the destruction process and Vishnu is seen as a creator who uses the remains of Shiva's destruction to regenerate what has been destroyed. One notable difference between Hinduism and other major religions is that it does not have a clear founder or starting point, rather it grew and spread possibly as early as 5500 BCE in the Indian subcontinent and changed over time based on Indian culture and economics. In the Indian empires from 600 BCE to 600 CE, Emperors maintained and further developed social systems that had been in place for a long time. The Aryans nomadic herders from Central Asia who had migrated into the Indian subcontinent by 1500 BCE had already established a caste system with four main groups of people. They are Brahmins or priests, Kshatriyas or warriors and aristocrats. Vaishyas or peasants and merchants and Sudras or serfs. This separation of people by class and job gained an even bigger footfold for Hinduism. According to Hindu myth, the god Purusha was assembled from the four castes with Brahmins at the head, Sudras at the feet. It was believed that the Sudras had been born into their caste because they committed bad deeds in the previous life or incarnation. The Hindu ideal of karma suggested that people who behaved well could be born into a higher caste. Now we can see the popularization of Hinduism. Hinduism originally started as a tradition from within the Brahmin class making it difficult for people of lower caste to access but it gradually grew more popular. 
sometime around 1500 to 500 BCE, two epic poems called Mahabharata and Ramayana were created and eventually written down in early centuries of the common era. These poems laid out information about Hindu values and gods, Vishnu for example, through dramatic stories of love and war. When these stories were written down they spread more quickly and easily throughout India. Another text, the Bhavad Gita was a poem that highlighted Hindu values and the possibility of salvation for people who lived those values. The Bhavad Gita helped to popularize Hinduism among lower castes because it asserted that people could achieve salvation by performing their caste duties properly. Hinduism versus politics, the somewhat romantic notion of Hinduism as a path which turns its back on the material world in a spiritual quest for realization of one's true self, God or ultimate truth would suggest a tradition above such worldly concern as politics. However, this is indeed a stereotype that is we can equate it with preconceptions. The concept of dharma, the eternal law, refers not only to the ultimate truth underpinning the universe but also to the order and harmony that ought to reflect this reality in the realm of human mortality and society. Thus, it is not a contradiction that Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, the philosopher whom as an Advaitin upheld the one ultimate reality of Brahman could also stress the need for ethical action in the relative reality of the social and political world and become the first vice president during the period of 1952 to 62 and the second president during the period of 1962 to 65 of India instead of an Aztec renouncer. He also taught that being a teacher was one of the most important roles anyone could have because education was the key to India's problems and asked for his birthday to be celebrated instead as teacher's day in India that is we will be celebrating it on September 5th every year. In earlier times the role of kings and the Satriya Varna class of rulers and warriors more generally was vital since only they could ensure the security of the people and establish order in society and thereby uphold dharma. Sacred texts may have a social and political resonance such as the moral teachings of the Dharma Shastra that in the laws of Manu includes a section on Raja Dharma that is the duty of the king. The king is counseled to cultivate virtue and avoid vice and reminded that to protect the people is the calling of the Kshatriya. He is informed that in military matters some methods are unacceptable such as the use of concealed or poisoned weapons and that enemy should not be attacked if injured or disarmed. Memorably, he is urged to plan with the patience of a heron and fight like a lion and a wolf if necessary, retreating with the speed of a head. The most famous ancient Indian treatise of statecraft that is Kautalya's Arthasastra dating from the centuries immediately before and after the start of the common era is addressed to the king and offers advice and guidance on a range of subjects such as the appointment and roles of ministers and officials, law and justice, economics and trade, foreign policy and military strategy. Asserting the primacy of artha that is wealth and power as necessary to the performance of dharma and the acquisition of karma that is pleasure and aesthetics, opinions are sharply divided on the moral quality of the work and it is perhaps best understood as realistic or pragmatic in approach. While the political landscape of the text has long ceased to exist, not least under Mughal rule, its very existence can be taken as evidence that India did not lack for political theory as was something claimed in defense of British imperialism. Religion has been an important factor in more recent Indian politics. The British 
as the India's imperial rulers saw religion as the foundation of Indian society and religious affiliation as a basic variable in the government and administration of the subcontinent. This had the effect on creating great emphasis on Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs as separate exclusive religious communities with potentially competing interests for the argument that colonialism created the very concept of Indian religions in the western sense. The sense of socially exclusive groups with strong external boundaries, essentialized characteristics and competing interests led to the formation of religion based political parties such as the Hindu Mahasabhas, then the Muslim leagues, for Sikhs it is Shiromani Akali Dal. Political parties with distinct religious constituencies and programs have continued to feature in independent India with the resurgence in the Hindu radical right in recent decades. Gandhi, who attempted to promote Hindu Muslim unity as well as non violent resistance as the way to persuade the British to leave India, his use of Hindu symbols and ideals, adapting the appearance of a traditional Hindu holy man and invoking Ram Rajya as a state of perfection inaugurated by Rama's divine kingship won much popular support among Hindus. This however differentiated him from his colleagues like Jawaharlal Nehru later the first prime minister of India whose socialist principles made him uncomfortable with Gandhi's outwardly religious appeal to the masses despite the close personal relationship of the two men. Other nationalists like Bal Gangadhar Tilak took a different approach. His appeal to Hindu practice and history, promotion of the Ganapati festival dedicated to Ganesha for political purposes and championing of Sivaji, a 17th century Maratha ruler and hero of anti-Muslim resistance as a role model was intended to unite Hindus at the cost of community relations with Muslims and did not exclude violence in service of Swaraj that is self rule. Political struggles over independence led in the end of Gandhi failing to prevent partition, the division of British India into two countries India and Pakistan which involved extreme communal violence. Though Gandhi was to meet his death at the hands of Naduram Godse, a Hindu who like other Hindu nationalists believed that Gandhi had made too many concessions to Pakistan. That independent India is a secular state was made clear in the 1976 42nd amendment to the constitution something that was implicit in the original 1950 constitutions commitment to freedom of religion, equality, non-discrimination and protection of minorities. What was meant was not a non-religious or anti-religious position, but a version of secularism that accepts all religions as valid that in fact owes much to the Hindu philosophy of Neo Vedanta. However, Hindu nationalism has become more influential in recent decades. V. D. Savarkar, a major ideal of Hindu nationalism put forward the hugely influential concept of Hindutva that is Hinduness in 1920s. Hindutva in his view was cultural not religious in character being based on a connection to India and common ethnicity. Accordingly, his vision of a Hindu Rashtra that is Hindu state drew a distinction between Hindus that is in religious sense together with Sikhs, Jains and Buddhists members of traditions of indigenous nature as its citizens and Christians and Muslims associated with traditions of foreign origin whose status as citizens was marginal at best. Now we can see the Hindu philosophies. The most common formulation of Hindu philosophy is six schools or six visions, six views or perspectives which are Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Samakya, Yoga, Vimamsa and Vedanta. They are considered as orthodox unlike Buddhist or Jain approaches. In that they 
acknowledged the authority of the Veda. However, as the Indologist like Halfas demonstrates, there were many other schools and this list of six became fixed only comparatively recent. Notwithstanding the convention of six schools, there were debates and disagreements within them, with the school of Vedanta covering several different philosophies often treated as schools in their own right. Moreover, only two of the schools that is Vimamsa and Vedanta actually involved the interpretation of Vedic texts. Of all these philosophies, it is Vedanta or to be more precise, Advaita Vedanta in its recent Neo-Vedic form that is probably most familiar. Advaita Vedanta associated with the 8th, 9th century thinkers like Shankara gave a non-dual account of Vedanta identifying the self Atman with ultimate reality Brahman at the higher level of truth and relegating the plurality of selves and physical objects to the lower level of truth. In the modern era, Advaita Vedanta was reworked by Vivekananda and popularized by Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, typically involving an emphasis upon the empirical reality of the world and an appeal to the oneness of humanity that accorded greater significance to ethical action in the world rather than renunciation, monasticism and spiritual liberation. Neo Vedanta promoted a positive image of Hinduism as tolerant and inclusive, defending it against allegations of confusion and incoherence arising out of a variety of its form. This was accomplished by appeal to the principle of hierarchy as allowing Hinduism to accommodate a range of different beliefs and practices as a unity in diversity. For such reasons, Neo Vedanta has proved hugely influential in modern Hinduism endorsed by leading nationalists and reformers and contributing towards the post-colonial project of forging a new Indian identity. It has also been attractive to Westerners who have been persuaded that Vedanta in this sense is central to Hinduism. Thank you.